Thank you, Beth. And good afternoon or morning to wherever you are in the world. Uh, this is truly an international town and gown webinar. I'm delighted to share that, that today we're going to break past the borders of the United States and look at some colleagues in Canada and the UK and perhaps beyond uh, and how they're responding to housing uncertainty. I'm gonna hand it over briefly to uh, the president of the UK Town and Gown Association and the vice chair of the International Town and Gown Association, Cooper Healy, to uh, give us a quick introduction to ITGA, UKT, UKTGA and uh, the partnership there. Thanks, AJ. Um, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are and welcome uh, to this international uh, housing webinar uh, brought to you by the International Town and Gown Association. And I think there are some of you on the call uh, today that um, are perhaps new to the ITGA. So um, just please allow me a second to let you know all about the fact that it is a premier resource for addressing challenges, emerging issues and opportunities between and amongst institutions of higher education and the communities in which they reside. Um, ITGA does pretty much lead on the town gown forefront um, and it is my absolute pleasure uh, to be a, an executive board member of the ITGA and also the co-chair of the international uh, committee. So AJ and I are here really trying to put the I into ITGA and so we're delighted to bring you uh, this, this, this day. Um, the first of what we hope will be a series of international housing webinars, uh, bringing you speakers from different corners of the universe uh, to uh, address the subjects of the day, the issues of the moment, the zeitgeist when it comes to the work that we all do uh, out there in town and college uh, settings in our local communities. So I'm really excited to hand back over to AJ, we, who is going to take us uh, through uh, the, the speakers that we've got lined up for you today. Um, we have built in some time for Q&A towards the end of the webinar. So please do use uh, the Q&A facility. Um, introduce yourselves if you would like to on that, if you have the facility to do so. If not, and there's a burning question or comment, that you'd like to make to one or all of our speakers, then please drop that in the chat and we'll moderate that once the speakers uh, have completed. Thanks very much for your attention. Over to you, AJ. Thanks so much, Cooper. So as president of the Town and Gown Association of Ontario, we represent the interests of communities and institutions in the province of Ontario, which is one of the largest subnational jurisdictions of publicly funded institutions anywhere in the world. To put things in context for folks, we are larger than the University of California system. We are larger than the State University of New York system. And we are all publicly funded institutions at polytechnic and university levels with campuses across Ontario, which is a large province and the largest province here in Canada. And so I am delighted to actually introduce an expert on studentification and youth experiences in cities. Dr. Nick Revington, the Assistant Professor of Urbanization, Culture and Society at the Institution Nationale de Research Scientifique in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, but also a former resident of Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. So, Dr. Revington, over to you. Thanks, AJ. Um, so I've been tasked today with providing a bit of a, an overview from an academic perspective of student housing issues uh, in something of a global perspective, and that's necessarily going to have to be a very quick overview given <clears throat> the format and the, the time constraints um, we have today. So the main way that, that issues of student housing and, and particularly the, the interactions of students and, and cities through housing is, is through this concept of studentification. And studentification refers to a process. It's the process by which students come to be concentrated in particular urban neighborhoods and all the impacts that follow on from that. And so those could be social, cultural, economic, or physical transformations uh, of, of the city or of particular neighborhoods in the city that result from that concentration of students. And the main causes, obviously, enrollment growth, um, 
and a lack of on-campus housing options mean there's more students looking for housing off campus. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize these other dimensions that can profoundly shape studentification and, and what that looks like, the extent to which students may be concentrated in a city. So that's, you know, landlords and developers, for instance, might uh, specialize in uh, providing housing to students, whereas others uh, might not and, and might in fact discriminate against students. And, and that could have an impact on where students uh, live in the city. Municipal planning and regulations, we'll see uh, later Tanya's uh, presentation, I'm sure we'll get into this, but the way cities regulate rental housing, the way they zone uh, permitting higher density residential uh, developments that could, could accommodate purpose-built student accommodations, for instance, that's going to also shape how and, uh, and where students live in a city. Um, next slide, please. And so looking at this um, in the, the US, the UK and, and Canada, um, much of the, the, the discourse, much of the academic research is looking at uh, the issues that arise from studentification and how do we manage those impacts on, on the broader community. And I think those impacts are gonna be familiar to the people in the, in the web, webinar today. Uh, on, the, on the slide are, are three examples that are all from Canada, but I could have just as easily found similar examples from the US or the UK. You know, so things like partying and, and noise and you know the, the sort of detritus that's le get, that gets left behind every time um, students move out at the end of the academic year. And so um, more recently in these contexts and some others, we see the emergence of, of private purpose-built student accommodation, which on the one hand tries to uh, create a, a product oriented to students as consumers that's more suited to their needs, but also um, in some instances, this is actually promoted through municipal policy or, or at least in, in local discourses as a way of trying to avoid these issues um, by um, creating a space for students to live outside of of other um, established neighborhoods. Next slide, please. I wanna contrast those with some, some other international contexts that are, are quite different. So on the left here is uh, a photo uh, from Concepcion, Chile. This is an informal neighborhood located in the hills above the university. Most of the two-story houses that you see in here, that second story was added by residents uh, as a way of creating space that could be rented out to students to earn some uh, extra income. And at the end of this alleyway here, there's a staircase and beside that staircase is actually a small business, um, sort of a cantina that serves uh, the, the neighborhood, but you know, a significant pr proportion of the neighborhood is students and they also rent rooms to students as well. So here in this context, not to say that there aren't issues, uh, but there is much more focus, you know, both in, in the, the kind of lived experiences of people here, but also in, in sort of the academic literature about these types of contexts on the, the sort of positive um, contributions of students to the livelihoods of other neighborhood residents. residents. Um, on the right is, a, is, a, is an example from China, and this is quite different in, in most Chinese universities. Uh, nearly all students are required to live on the university campus and those who either don't because they kind of break the rules or they're uh, exempted for various reasons. For instance, they're married. Um, they're housed sometimes in these, this is kind of, kind of an informal mode of construction that, that urban villagers build these apartments to house students. And so again, this is not the same as the purpose-built student accommodation we're used to seeing in North America or, or Europe. Um, and again, there's this sort of an economic benefit to the local um, villagers to construct these. Next slide. So in the academic literature, really when we're talking about student housing, student experiences of living off campus are, are something that have really only recently uh, garnered attention. And this is because of kind of um, housing crisis that seem to be emerging <laughs> pretty much everywhere. So we've got examples here from Canada, the Netherlands, Ireland, Turkey, you know, you could find others um, that talk about the difficulty students have finding housing, finding affordable housing. 
but I, I think it's also important to think about um, studentification, as it's, you know, again, the concentration of students in particular neighborhoods and the risks and opportunities that that can pose for students. And so from a risk perspective, kind of counterintuitively, but studentification can, can actually kind of reduce the supply of housing for students and lead to increasing rents. And this is because as a particular neighborhood comes to be recognized as, as the student area, um, uh, students might not be as, as likely to look beyond that area. So, you know, the housing supply hasn't necessarily changed, but the, the perception of it has. And so, so that can kind of have the effect of, of seeming to reduce supply. Uh, if a neighborhood becomes effectively an annex of the university campus, I think we, we should be concerned about what that means in terms of the connections that students can build to the broader community. And then finally, I put a question mark on this one. Oftentimes, studentification is associated with changes in the commercial activity in the area. And so if that's uh, you know, more bars, more fast food options, uh, increasingly in some contexts, um, cannabis retail, what impact does that have on, on, on sort of healthy living? On the other side, in terms of opportunities, I think it's important to recognize that um, students have a, a strong sense of security when they live around other students. I think it's important to recognize the opportunities for socialization with other students. Now, obviously, that can sometimes get out of hand, and you know there can be behavioral issues that occur. But I think we we can't throw the, the baby out with the the bathwater, um, so to speak. In, in recognizing the importance of, of socialization between students. Finally, again, with a question mark, could concentrations of students near campus favor active mobility, perhaps favor um, a more robust public transit network? Those things would both um, contribute to students' well-being, but might also have positive spillovers for the, for the rest of the community. And so with that, I'll leave it there. Um, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Dr. Revington. And I wanna thank you for providing a really great overview for our audience of studentification around the world and some of the risks and opportunities that there are with this phenomenon. So I guess it's more than perfect timing now to move into an excellent case study of studentification on the ground. And I'm excited to introduce the senior policy planner for the city of Waterloo, Tanya Couric, who was also responsible for uh, many of the policies and initiatives that are found in the city of Waterloo related to the Northdale uh, master plan and secondary planning area, as well as the student accommodation strategy that is currently underdeveloped or under development. So uh, not underdeveloped, it is under development. Uh, so Tanya, uh, take it away. Thanks, AJ. And hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here uh, today uh, to share with you our experience at the city of Waterloo in terms of student accommodations. Next slide, please. So for those that you, uh, of you that might not be aware, the city of Waterloo, we're located in southwestern Ontario, uh, Canada. We are one hour away from Toronto and a relatively easy drive, uh, you know, to, to the U.S. We're a mid-sized city. We have a population of about 150,000 people, and we're home to three post-secondary institutions, the University of Waterloo, Wilfrid Laurier University, and Conestoga College. And there's about 81,000 students enrolled at these three institutions, recognizing that many of them require housing uh, when they come to study here. Next slide, please. And this is just a map of the city. Um, as you can see, uh, the location of our three post-secondary institutions. Interestingly enough, they are located five, a five minute drive from each other. Um, and they are surrounded by our near campus neighborhoods, Northdale being the most prominent of them. Next slide, please. So at the city of Waterloo, we strongly value um, the asset that, uh, that students are to our community. They are a tremendous asset. And we've long recognized how important good housing is to student health, uh, well-being, and academic success. So the importance of enabling and facilitating housing is super important. One of the interesting things is in Canada, legally, there's no such thing as student housing uh, because under the laws of Canada and Ontario, students similar to any other demographic have the ability to reside in any accommodations. So even though for the presentation, I am uh, referring to student housing, really what I'm referring to is housing geared towards students or oriented or centered around students. Next slide, please. 
So starting in the mid 2000s, um, the city of Waterloo uh, undertook a heightened density study and up a series of nodes and corridors, uh, largely major arterials, the edges of some of the neighborhoods to allow for higher density development. And this was in recognition of the fact that we were experiencing significant population growth, which included students, as well as we were experiencing a diminishing vacant uh, land supply. At the same time in our city uh, official plan, which is the long range plan for our city, uh, how it's going to grow and evolve, we recognize the importance of providing housing uh, for users of our post-secondary institutions. And the plan specifically uh, encourages the location and construction of that housing first and foremost at the main campuses of the institutions. And then secondly, um, in our designated nodes and corridors that are in close proximity to the main campuses. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, one of our older maps of our nodes and corridors framework when it was first implemented. Um, and um, the three institutions are located um, kind of in that, in that center area. And what you can clearly see is there's a series of nodes and corridors uh, you know, in that regard directly adjacent or very near walking distance to the three institutions. Next slide, please. So in terms of our nodes and corridor strategy, you know, uh, despite um, that strategy and trying to kind of direct where intensification was uh, going to incur, um, our neighborhoods, especially our near neighbor, uh, near campus neighborhoods, started to experience um, significant, you know, uh, student uh, growth, um, not just on the edges where we were kind of directing and hoping to have that intensification, but also in the interior of neighborhoods. Um, and this was largely due to increasing enrollment at our three uh, post-secondary institutions, as well as more and more students um, looking for housing off campus. Next slide, please. And as a result, um, what ended up happening is uh, we ended up actually re-urbanizing um, our most prominent uh, near campus neighborhood, that being Northdale. And in 2012, uh, Waterloo City Council approved a new planning framework, which essentially allowed for intensification and mixed use throughout the whole entire neighborhood. So if you look at the map, um, with the kind of dotted line, that's our Northdale neighborhood. And just to give you a sense of the scale of intensification, the white area allows for six story development. The orange area allows for eight story development. The blue area allows for 12 story development and the chocolate brown allows for 25 stories. And as I said, uh, we have facilitated and enabled uh, intensification throughout the whole entire neighborhood. Next slide, please. And uh, since the implementation of that framework, um, the neighborhood has experienced significant development, intensification, um, and uh, redevelopment. And uh, such that we've had over 5,000 units built, um, about 7,850 beds, um, 390,000 uh, square feet of non-residential space, largely commercial and retail, and over $1 billion in building permit activity. Next slide, please. But neighborhoods are not just about, you know, intensification and accommodating population growth, whether or not that's, you know, uh, families, uh, seniors or students, community infrastructure is absolutely critical to support uh, increasing population. With that in mind, uh, we have created two parks in the neighborhood. We've also been um, creating walkways to break up uh, a number of our larger blocks to facilitate movement within the neighborhood. And we've also commenced on doing a number of streetscape improvements um, on the streets uh, in that neighborhood um, in order to support a more walkable, uh, transit-friendly uh, neighborhood. Next slide, please. Um, and so our Northdale neighborhood, um, as well as our near campus neighborhoods have all uh, resulted in us being known as the capital of off campus purpose built student housing in all of Canada. Um, this largely st stems from work that actually Dr. Revington did, uh, where he ana analyzed this. And what we can clearly see is like approximately 50% of all the off campus purpose built student housing in Canada is located in the city of Waterloo. Um, and we are far above um, other municipalities in that regard. Next slide, please. But 
despite that significant construction of housing gear towards students that has been built off campus, um, similar to other municipalities throughout the whole entire country, we too are faced with a housing crisis. And it's not just impacting students, it's impacting every single demographic. And that's shown here in terms of um, the rental market statistics we have for our city, which shows we have low vacancy. Next slide, please and escalating rents, particularly for units that are available um, or vacant and are able to be rented out. Next slide, please. So in terms of a city, um, as well as our community partners, it's super important for us to have up-to-date and comprehensive information so that all the stakeholders can make informed decisions on their actions as it relates to student accommodations. As previously mentioned, legally there's no such thing, um, or technically there's no such thing as student housing. Um, so as you can imagine, data on this information is hard to come by. So our local Waterloo Town and Gown Committee actually um, creates a student accommodations report that they work on um, uh, in order to get a clear idea of what's going on um, in this landscape. And we just recently um, released, um, the committee recently released their third report. Uh, it went to Waterloo City Council in September, and it focuses on three areas, student housing supply, demand, and the results of a student survey. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple of those key findings. Next slide, please. So in terms of our supply demand um, analysis, what we found was there's a potential deficit of about 4,730 beds geared towards students. Um, I will note a couple of things. Um, there are some limitations with the data which are referenced in the report. Um, but what we can clearly see is the number of tenants looking for accommodations outnumbers the number of on and off campus um, accommodations that would be available to them. I will note that this information does not include about 4,600 beds, which are currently under review in the development department and will be potentially coming downstream, hopefully um, sooner rather than later. Next slide, please. In addition, uh, we administered um, a, as a committee um, a survey to students uh, to understand their housing expectations, satisfaction levels, and their experiences. And some of the findings that stood out to us is while many students were satisfied with their accommodations, uh, many are finding it hard to secure housing, particularly housing that meets their needs. Uh, as we can see here, 63% uh, of students said they found it difficult to secure housing. Not only that, um, people are paying, or students are paying more than they have expected. So only 42% said their living expenses were expected. Um, the rest identifying that it was more than they had expected. And rents have almost doubled since our last report in 2017. Next slide, please. In addition, we asked students uh, to identify whether or not they felt they had been significantly impacted by housing costs within the last year. Of those that responded, about 50% said they had. And these are the areas where they identified they had been impacted, recognizing that students could select all that apply. And what we clearly see here is one, students are um, settling for accommodations that don't meet their needs. Um, it's impacting other areas of their life, uh, such as food, and, and they're having to make certain trade-offs. Um, some have been provisionally accommodated without security of tenure, for example, couch surfing or living in short-term rentals, and some within the last year didn't even have that. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of um, kind of a little bit of an overview, as noted, we here at the city, we know how important good housing is uh, to the success of our students, and we want our students to be successful because we hope many of them will decide to remain here after they graduate and take up re permanent residency. Um, as noted, uh, the city of Waterloo, we're known as the capital in Canada of off-campus purpose-built student housing. However, um, similar to elsewhere, we're also being impacted by the national housing crisis. And at this time, there is a deficit of beds available to our students, recognizing we do have a number of applications that we are working through the development process. But as noted, you know, accommodation costs really are impacting students and they're finding it difficult to secure accommodations that meet their needs. 
And, you know, as a town and gown committee um, a member, um, as well as our larger town and gown committee, you know, all of us, uh, not just the municipality, but the institutions, lenders, um, everyone has a role to play and it will take all of us working together to tackle this important issue. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tanya. And I really want to thank you for sharing what I think is you know, the most intense form of purpose-built student accommodation development we've seen in Canada and maybe around the world. And even still, uh, there is uncertainty and there is challenges in housing all the students in these institutions. And so um, it's really great to see that the Town and Gown Committee is, is so committed to studying student accommodations and developing a strategy to move forward. Um, and we're really excited to see where that strategy goes in the next year. So thank you for sharing. All right, um, so I'm happy to now bring it uh, to the other side of Toronto, about two hours up the highway heading towards Montreal, to the beautiful city of Kingston, um, which is the 24th largest uh, city in the country and home to three institutions, notably Queen's University, St. Lawrence College, uh, which is a community college, and the Royal Military College in Canada, which is a university specifically dedicated for the training of officers and specialized technicians in the military. Um, these are all located within the core area of Kingston, so the existing developed area, uh, posing some really interesting challenges around uh, taxation and providing city services. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce today Councillor Glenn, uh, who represents the districts surrounding Queen's University and uh, also uh, heavily involved in the city's town and gown activities. So, Councillor Glenn. Could you tell us a little bit more about what is so exciting about Kingston as a town gown community? Thanks, AJ. And uh, I'm thrilled to be here and, and become involved in this conversation. So uh, as you said, uh, what's, what's interesting and what's unique about Kingston? Uh, Kingston, I think, for student experience has been rated very highly. And that's really due to our geography. We sit right on the water. And what we hear repeatedly and what we've seen repeatedly in studies is that students love the outdoor life that's available here. They love the easy access to downtown, uh, access to the waterfront. So in that regard, we, we are a city that has a lot that's available to our students. However, the pressures are enormous. And so you sort of alluded to that as you introduced this. Um, I'm a, a counselor who's just about a year into uh, her first term as a counselor. Um, and as AJ noted, Queen's University, which is the largest institution here in the city, is smack dab in the middle of my district. Um, I, I feel such a sense of envy towards Waterloo and its ability to have been able to, to build so many houses for students, to do that purpose build, to have locations to do that. The unique situation that Kingston finds itself in is we are a very historic old city. And Queen's University is in the heart of um, a historic district. And for anybody who's not familiar, what that means here in Ontario is there are restrictions on what can be built and how that can be built. And it all has to go through massive heritage permitting. In addition, Kingston um, took a long time after amalgamation. And again, for anybody who's unfamiliar, uh, the surrounding areas uh, for Kingston were originally different little towns and communities. And uh, back about 20 years ago or so, they underwent amalgamation. So there was a difference in the zoning in all those areas. And it wasn't until recently, the last few years, that uh, the city completed an overview of that zoning and came out with a new uh, set of zoning provisions. So that's now created consistency, but it's sort of left us in an awkward position because we haven't been doing as much building as we could. So the heritage issues, uh, having to uh, redo all that zoning, and then um, our university actually sort of bucked the trend of when other universities were expanding and did not expand initially um, until the last several years. So we've seen a massive influx of students. Um, Queen's University and St. Lawrence College that AJ mentioned are actually located geographically very close to each other. You can walk between the two. And again, down in historic districts. 
Um, on top of that, we're also a city that has a lot of government institutions. So we have a lot of land that is held uh, by the provincial and federal governments over which we have no control. So unfortunately, we're struggling because we don't have the spots to do the building that we'd like to do. Uh, so from a political point of view, we're juggling a number of factors. So uh, a lot of the larger buildings that we are trying to build are uh, coming up against, you know, I, I understand that people refer to it as nimbyism, but the character of the town is also very heritage based. It's one of our uh, key features in terms of tourism. So we're juggling multiple uh, sort of demands that are coming at us as city council. So stepping into this role and being uh, the counselor that has the most students to consider as constituents, I'm taking a different approach. So we are reconstituting um, what Tanya referred to as a town and gown committee. So we're uh, forming a post-secondary working group here in the city. And we've opened up those conversations to try to work together. And I think one of the terms when I was doing some research into this area that really rang true to me was relentless collaboration. And I think that came out of uh, what had happened with, with Penn State and how they had approached things. And so I would say that that characterizes our current approach to dealing with our issues of town and gown relentless collaboration. Um, I'm in regular meetings with the uh, university and we're now looping in the other institutions to those conversations about how we're going to build. So we finally have gotten to the point where what we're putting on the table is that you know P3 build where we're talking about doing that collaboration and partnership. The university sector here in Ontario is also struggling from the fact that um, there's been chronic underfunding over the years. So money's available for, for building uh, from the university perspective just don't exist. Uh, they often can't access other uh, levels of government funding for building. So for example, one of the things that our federal government has done here in Canada to try and alleviate our housing crisis is they've provided funding envelopes. And so uh, municipalities and others apply to get this funding, but there's no um, funding available for purpose-built student residences. And the universities have no way to access that funding envelope. Um, in order to try and open that up, um, I'm advocating to the federal level to give consideration for that. The other factor that Kingston is facing that's a little bit different, uh, we also have an aging population. We have a large number of retirees. And during the pandemic, we also saw an in-migration of um, individuals leaving larger urban centers like Toronto, which is just a couple of hours down the road from us, and moving here to Kingston. We already had one of the lowest vacancy rates in terms of rentals uh, in the province, and that only exacerbated it. So uh, these multiple sorts of pressures from a political point of view are creating um, a, a lot of um, need for continued outreach to our residents. So one of the things that we're also engaging in a number of other councillors have been doing this um, are a large number of town hall meetings with our residents. So I think it's really important to uh, dial down the rhetoric that we hear going on between regular residents and the student population. Um, it's, in my opinion, from what I've seen here, created a situation where we're not actually getting down to providing solutions. So we're changing that conversation by bringing the groups together, by bringing the residents in and having the informed discussions around what's happening with the students. Uh, so we've already heard about uh, the increasing uh, cost pressures on students and how that's impacting their ability to be successful in their educational pursuits. Um, I think it was heartbreaking to me to find out that one of our largest food banks sits on the university campus. So we have students struggling just to be able to um, have, have a, a good meal every day. Um, so with that in mind, we recognize that we have to find a way to bring the costs down. Um, our student housing costs are really high. Um, you know, and I, I like to speak to the personal aspects of this and the interactions that I've had with my student constituents. And that's one of the things that 
I've emphasized in redefining the relationship that we have here in Kingston with the students. When I campaigned, I actually campaigned to the students. I was advised not to waste my time, not to go there because students wouldn't vote. And the perspective that I took was whether they decided to vote or not, at the end of the day, they were still going to be my constituents. They were still going to be the responsibility um, of the city because they live here. So with that in mind, um, we've done much more outreach. And uh, during our move-in period in September, a number of the downtown councillors went to uh, the university sidewalk sale. We set up and we spent the time interacting with that student population. But going back to that personal touch, those students came to us and the needs that they expressed were enormous. So I think it's contingent upon any of the municipalities that have student residences that they recognize those needs and start to work towards addressing them. So I had a student come up to me who was already you know, enrolled, ready to go to school, had not yet found a place to live and didn't know how to do that. He was couch surfing. Um, he was practically beside himself, um, you know, and he was a really bright young man. It wasn't for lack of ability, lack of effort on his part. But by doing that outreach, he had somebody to talk to who could help guide him through that process of where can I go to find a place to be? And that's one of the biggest things that uh, I think we've been trying to do is, is um, move towards greater outreach. One of the other initiatives that uh, I've recently launched um, at Queen's University, they are building a new student life center. The city is committed to setting up a permanent spot in that student life center so that there will be constant contact with the student population um, in a place where they come to regularly. So they don't have to seek us out in quite the same way. Uh, so I think when we're looking at housing and um, giving consideration for how we're going to do this, it's about building those conversations. Uh, so we're really in the initial stages uh, in terms of that bigger conversation, but we're laying some really good groundwork and uh, again, very envious of what's going on in Waterloo. We do have a large um, sector of our um, city that doesn't have property on it, but it sits above one of our major highways and getting services to it. So getting that basic infrastructure to it is cost prohibitive. So we unfortunately don't have the ability to very easily and affordably build uh, another district. So that's one of the major challenges we're also facing. Uh, but we're hopeful. Uh, the conversations have started. The university does have some spots uh, that we think we'll be able to uh, potentially assist them in building. Uh, but again, relentless collaboration, and we're hoping that that uh, gets us moving in the right direction. Thanks so much, Councillor Glenn. And I think you've provided a really interesting perspective and particularly some really interesting and unique ideas about um, locating city offices within a student life center, uh, really pursuing that relentless collaboration, um, which I think you know will work exceptionally well in the Kingston uh, Queens, St. Lawrence College and RMC context. So looking forward to further working with you and uh, seeing how the town and gown story continues um, onwards. Okay, so I'm uh, super happy to bring in now uh, someone from across the big pond um, over in the UK, uh, Richard Stott, um, who is, uh, you know what, executive director of uh, Kexkill Developments, but also my understanding is just a really interesting town and gown character over there with Cooper. And so, uh, Richard, how about you take it away and, and share with us um, some of your work across the way? Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, I'm the group managing director of the of Kexkill. We're in nine UK cities are in Germany as well. We're a completely private company. We have no external shareholders. So what we do, we can do. Um, which does differentiate ourselves from listed companies and probably private equity. Um, this is one, I'm going to talk about one of our um, investments, which is the university quarter in Kingston upon Hull. We bought 200 houses, cluster houses from the university and spent an awful lot of money on them. Um, we also, also had three halls of residence next to the university campus already. 
And so that means, which is quite unique anywhere, that a private company like us owns 97% of everything adjoining a campus. It's all under one ownership, which is quite responsibility. We also have, you see by the picture, a kiosk and a tuk-tuk. Everybody has a tuk-tuk. And there's just an example of a, a street food party that we had in October to welcome first years. Can have the next slide, please? And that says there it costs time and money, and it does. I mean, that's the difference between us and private equity is that it's not a five-year plan. It's not a 10-year plan. This is a forever plan. Whatever we plan for, we plan for it to go on and on and on. Uh, and that's art on the wall. We have art trails. That's lighting for housing, um, notice boards. And then the next slide will have a bit more detail. All of this presentation, my short little presentation, is available I'm quite happy to share it and I'm quite happy for people to email me and I'll always reply. Um, off campus, the dream, that is, this is the dream, a semi-public place where you can just stroll along happy, um, looking in the sunshine, but that doesn't happen in the UK much, uh, and just pass the time of day. Um, the things that have really worked for us, we've done all of this. Everything in this slide, we've done. From 2018, when we started buying the houses and ensuiting them, et cetera, we've done all this. We paid for the roads to be uh, the bit. I'll tell you the things that have really made a difference, but people don't really notice is that we reduced the cars in the area. We paid for the local authority to put speed limits, to put speed bumps, to make it a nicer walk um, for students to the, because this is the main walkway into the campus. So reducing cars was a brilliant thing and that has absolutely worked and another thing that's worked is that we put seat close circuit tv external close circuit tv in the whole area along with sign along with signage and that's helped because people feel safer and other things we've just everything on that list street food pop-up events we've got a kiosk we all our staff are branding if it doesn't move we brand it um and that hopefully bearing in mind students are transient they're not there for very long uh, maximum with us two or three years it kind of gives them a sense of belonging um, everything is branded as the university quarter which we registered the name so it's our name and another thing that's really important is our office staff are not front of house well they are front of house but they're not the first point of contact for any of our tenants it's the cleaners. And if they're going in every week, absolutely essential that the mental health trained. So, I mean, they're the people who are going to walk in and say, well, why isn't he come out of his bedroom? Why aren't you happy? And again, the food outlets that we've opened, they're mental health trained because sometimes, and I've watched this happen, the only person that speak to somebody when they're on the way to the lecture is when they go grab a burger or a coffee and the people in our kiosk are trained to remember people's names i'm terrible they're brilliant so when somebody comes up hi fiona you had a good day or you look a bit down it kind of makes everything different it kind of puts us it puts a massive smile on my face because i can see the kiosk from my um, head office which is brilliant um i'm going to fly through this next slide please stakeholders clearly we're a private company um i've got to keep the bank happy i really have to keep the bank happy so i do invite them down and bizarrely on one of those photographs i look like i'm um it's a homage to the us i've got a cowboy hat on and that will be some collaboration that we've done some research we've done with the university we find the business schools get us more i don't know why well I do know why and we do quite a lot of collaboration with them. And anybody who wants to be come and see us and talk to us, we always say yes, because why wouldn't you? And a lot of the people who work in our group came from the business school of the university. When you've got such a brilliant employment pool there, you, you'd be foolish not to take them. And local authority, we try and work hard with them. It's very hard. The planning system in this country is broken. It's just banging your head against a wall, but there's some great people and some great counsellors that we get on with really well. Um, and another thing, long-term residents, there are long-term residents. We will do that, repair their gutters. We will invite them to our parties. They don't always want to come, but 
they really like it to be involved and they really like to be involved with international students in particular because they just they they love living in an area which is vibrant full of students um next slide please yeah we've had ridiculous ambitions over the years um international students to the uk bring in or generate around about 42 billion last year which is quite a big sum i thought it was about time we said thank you really um none of this nonsense rhetoric i hear from the from our um, government really thank you and we wanted to show that so we had a year and it's carrying on bus trips um supporting graduations and getting to know them really because you know some of them have really tough stories and they're, they're here they're part of the university quarter and sometimes I get the feeling they're not really valued. I mean, that's in the middle there. That's me. I've I got a unbelievably got a high, um, got a roof next to Westminster Abbey overlooking the um, part, Houses of Parliament. And then obviously, because I'm from England, that's a, the average house that we live in next to that. Um, Cooper will live in the West Wing of that. And that's where we went to Castle Howard. And they shut Castle Howard for us to go there. And it was a absolutely... I brought a tear to my eye, and there we are in Whitby, the home of Dracula. These people had never got out of where they were staying, and to take them out on a bus trip didn't cost a lot to us, but wow, it was fantastic. And the last little photograph on the right-hand side at the bottom, that was three weeks ago. It was a hackathon at the business school on where we're supporting a team who have come up with a brilliant business idea, and we're going to commercialise it with them. And that kind of makes a difference to me. Um, next slide, please. Has it worked? Oh, if you are day-to-day -day involved with something like this, yes, it's a safe, affordable area for students, 100% occupancy, that great, the banks are happy. Crime now is virtually non-existent. Bad people don't come in because they know they're on a camera. Uh, and really hijinks from students, bit of a, you know, you have a party, big deal. It's not, it's, it's, that's not what the cameras are there for. Uh, and the route to campus is safer. We've created employment through the food outlets and the spin-off supported businesses. Pastoral care, as you can see, is much easier because we've got so many more points where people can spot where things go wrong. And as everybody in this, I guess, in this, um, webinar bad things happen and if you can reduce one bad thing happening that's you feel a bit better for it um so from an owner operator perspective am i really happy do i think whoa i'm fantastic no the journey continues every day you get up you think well there's more to do and why haven't we done that and this is looking a bit tired and you never feel relaxed at all i never i still wake up at three o'clock in the morning worrying about it because you do and we mirror the university's performance. And, I mean, this is just a moan, but we are forever the greedy landlord because that's what landlords are. Notwithstanding the fact we're not a greedy landlord, we are, you know, we do our best, the level best. And we, everybody you employ, we all went to university. And it's, yeah, there, there is that sort of perception that oh they're greedy landlords they would say that but actually it's us putting the money in to help everybody else and it is a symbiotic relationship with the university they do well we do well we look after everybody well the word gets out there um and so the last 12 months have seen us ramp up experiential experiential activities and collaborations final slide please thank you um, anyone can email me. Anybody can have the uh, presentation. There's a selection of photographs there. And it, we love doing what we do. And it's just, I don't know if we're unique, being able to buy 97% of everything next to a campus. But in other areas, we're also doing similar things. And a lot of this is born from our adventure buying stuff in Germany, which has given us experience. So thanks very much for listening to me. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, really fascinating project and, and 
really development that you're leading there, um, as well as I think, you know, expanding um, into other uh, communities around Europe. Um, and I'm, what I'm really fascinated about is we've seen all the way from informal community organizing around providing student housing in Chile that Dr. Revington talked about. We've talked about where government kind of uh, oversees and, and controls private development in an area, which we've seen in Waterloo, and now all the way to where a private actor has come in and transformed an area to support student housing. So really, I think, you know, we've covered sort of the gamut of option, options for um, creating student neighborhoods. So now I'm excited to jump into three prepared questions that uh, were provided to our panelists before time. And uh, I encourage people to keep putting questions and answers in the chat. Um, thank you to our panelists who have been answering them as they've come in. Uh, we may answer some of them live, but I think I'll also just keep letting people type up their responses because uh, that's often a lot more personal and direct way to, uh, to address a question. Um, all the slides are gonna be made available after the presentation with a webinar recording, so not to worry about those. Um, Beth will get those posted up. And uh, I guess to dive into things, um, the first question here that I've, I have for folks is, where have you seen the most success in creating healthy, thriving, and vibrant communities for students, faculty and staff, and host community members? And also, where have you seen it go wrong? And how would you have corrected those issues? And maybe you've already corrected them. I think Richard's probably definitely seen things go wrong in the past and have had to <laughs> introduce some corrections. Um, but I'm also interested to hear from other folks of, of where they've seen things go right and things go wrong. So anyone want to dive in first here? All right, Richard, how about I, how about I jump uh, to you? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to say where things aren't quite right. And I'll just talk about the one outside my office, which we own 97%. It's a very tightly defined area. So next door to it is private housing. That they, they, despite students being in this area for seventy plus years, they say, "Well, I don't want students there." And they, and that you, we, even though the area's improved, there's less crime, we still get them tapping on the door saying, "Well, there was a party last night, and look what they've done." Um, but what we counter that, we say, "Well, come to our parties. We're having a barbecue. Why don't you come along? Why don't you come along to last week's dog cuddling, which is bizarrely very, very popular, incredibly popular in the UK." I don't God knows why, um, but um, and also that's... popular here in Canada. So don't feel yeah. alone, Richard. Don't really, <laughs> you'll get it. Um, but yeah, that's that is um, inviting them, and then there isn't just breaking down the barrier. There will always be some, and then you know, always be somebody complaining. <laughs> yes, Doctor Revington. So you toss up. Sure. Uh, yeah, I guess. I'm going to start with with the what goes wrong part of the question. And I think for me, one of the examples here in Canada is um, here in Montreal, the University of Montreal recently opened a new campus kind of right in the, the center of the island of Montreal. And it's adjacent to Park Extension, which for those who are unfamiliar is one of the poorest neighborhoods in Canada. It's a, a very ethnically diverse immigrant receiving neighborhood, um, but, but quite a vibrant neighborhood. Um, when this campus was proposed, a number of members of the community and, and activists and, and, and academics raised a bunch of concerns about the impact this would have on like the campus. That this is going to cause displacement as students are going to start to want to live in this neighborhood so that they're close to, the, to this new university campus. And this is quite a large campus um, development, I should say. It's not just, you know, one building. It's like a campus. Um, uh, or that's the eventual plan is that's going to scale up. And the early the, the university's early plans included kind of recognized this and included a student housing component and they ultimately uh scrapped that and um uh instead what what ended up being built was sort of private um kind of high-end uh condominium apartments and so i think this is a case where the university's you know, like not only does the university's action in this particular case kind of run counter to a, a lot of the best practices that some of have, have been discussed here, but, you know, in broader um, research literature on these issues, uh, the, the negative impacts that the community was warning about 
are already being seen and you know, researchers and activists have already pointed to increases in, in evictions and rents um, in the park extension neighborhood. So I think that's really was a missed opportunity to, to not do something um, a bit more uh, a bit more to kind of provide a dedicated space for students that that could reduce the impact on on this particularly uh, marginalized neighborhood. Um, in terms of successes, I think without a doubt in Canada, it's the Northdale neighborhood that that Tanya talked about. Um, not to say it's necessarily perfect, but I think the things that are are maybe wanting are things that are are beyond Tanya's control, right? These are, things that are beyond the scope of municipal planning. It'd be maybe nice, there is commercial space, but maybe it would be nice to have, you know, a, a grocery store, like a full grocery store more integrated in the neighborhood, you know, services that would, you know, attract other non-student residents. Like these are all things that are <laughs> are not um, within Tanya's remit, but I think I think are things that would be nice to see. But it's definitely the, the most successful case in Canada. Thanks, Dr. Revington. Uh, so Councillor Glenn, thoughts here on this? Uh, so I, I guess I'm going to speak to some things that we have had a bit of success with. Um, and, you know, going to what Richard had said about that pastoral care aspect, the inclusion in the community. So we've had a lot of really great grassroots things. So for example, uh, neighborhood barbecues where the students have been invited and they're feeling included. When we went to that sidewalk sale, part of what we did wasn't just to talk about housing, but also to talk about what there was available to do in the community. At the time, we had an open farms event going on. And, you know, the minute we mentioned those things, students were all over, wow, that would be great to go to. And so this constant you know, kind of outreach approach, I think makes such a big difference in terms of integrating students into our community. We're also, of course, concerned about retaining uh, students here in our, our districts and areas uh, because we've got workforce demands that we can't meet. Um, so we did a, an initiative here at the city to encourage students to stay during the summer season and work in Kingston. Um, it was highly successful in that we got a lot of students to stay. We didn't um, anticipate that on our uh, July 1st long weekend that we would end up with such a big student party. But all that being said, um, we saw it as a big success. So, you know, these are the things that I think ha have been beneficial. Um, I was really heartened to see the University of Ottawa. So for anybody who's not familiar, Ottawa is just a couple of hours away from Kingston. It's our nation's capital. And they have some of the same town and gown sorts of issues, but the city's a lot larger. Um, and in around the homecoming time when traditionally universities have a major football game and there's usually a large student party, they the university took a different approach and embraced it and they had a tailgate party and that tailgate party included alcohol but in a constructive way where there was oversight where there were people there to assist and help and make sure that people weren't getting into trouble so there was a lot of harm reduction so I thought that was actually a major win for them this year it cut down on policing one of the other issues that we we face with um, the sheer number of students in the city is when there is a party um, that spills out onto our streets our policing costs are huge they're costing our small city one and a half million dollars a year uh, one and a half million dollars we could be putting towards so many other things. So we're trying to get a handle on on that. Um, so I'm hopeful that we'll pick that up from Ottawa, maybe use that as a model here. But those are some of the, I think, positive practices that go beyond just providing housing, but making sure that students um, have a way to integrate better in the community. And we find that once residents connect with students, there becomes a mutual respect piece. And the best things that I hear when I hear some of my senior residents, I had a gentleman contact me uh, last year right after a major snowstorm and said, hey, the sidewalks didn't really get cleared as quickly as I'd like. I was so glad that a couple of Queens students helped me get over the snowbank. Um, so we know that we've got lots of really great students and that's the sort of thing that we're starting to, to see with that continued outreach to the students and including them in the community as much as possible. Thank you, Councillor Glenn. Uh, so, Tanya, uh, anything you'd like to add to, to what folks have shared so far? I know Dr. Revington kind of called out some challenges in the Northdale area that, um, you know, we all know are a little bit beyond the remit of a municipal planner. But I'm wondering from your perspective in developing the Northdale plan, what were some, you know, areas that you, you pointed to 
um, around the world to say, hey, maybe we can try some things here um, in Waterloo. Yeah, so on our end, um, really what the conversation came around to uh, was having, you know, and leaning into some, you know, difficult and uncomfortable yeah. conversations and recognizing, you know, uh, our journey has evolved, uh, particularly in years past, you know, we had tried the diversion and restriction and prevention method, um, and it really didn't help. And, uh, you know, we came to the realization, you know, you can try to stick your head in the sand and ignore it. You can try to prevent it, um, but it's going to happen. So you can ignore it. Um, it's going to happen. Um, you know, um, there will be, you know, health and safety issues, um, other illegal issues, or you know what, you can be proactive and you can set out a planning framework, which sets your intentions in terms of, um, you know, these are the things that we expect uh, in our neighborhoods and our communities. And as I said, um, for us, it doesn't matter whether it's students, um, permanent residents, families, seniors, single family or single person households. At the end of the day, in terms of municipality, we are focused on building communities um, and, you know, providing, you know, places for people to live, work, learn and play. Um, and so, as I said, uh, we have tried many approaches over the year. And one of the things I will share, you know, that kind of diversion, restriction, prevention, at least here, we found that that didn't work. Um, and so, yeah, we kind of then uh, decided to kind of explore more, okay, well, okay, that's not working. So what we're going to do is, you know, we, we recognize that we need to accommodate students, we understand how important housing is to their success. So let's make sure that the housing that is being built is safe, it's suitable, you know, it has amenities, um, you know, whether that's commercial, otherwise, and that's really the approach that we have taken. Um, in terms of um, successes, um, one of the things that um, I will note, and I'm very intrigued about it, and I must admit, I don't have all the information, uh, but one of the things that um, I've been interested in is um, the University of British Columbia out on the West Coast of Canada. Um, you know, information that I have kind of received is they've done a significant amount of work in terms of enabling on campus bed uh, construction, not just for their students, but also for their staff and faculty. Um, and they have, I think, over 13,000 uh, beds to kind of support that. And that to me is very intriguing because I know a lot of the focus is on student accommodations, but oftentimes, uh, one of the things that we forget is there are people that um, help to run the institutions, staff, faculty at all income levels, and, you know, the importance of housing to support them. As noted, um, I am not 100% first on British Columbia, but it's one of the things that has caught our attention, and I'm hoping to learn a little bit more about how they were able to achieve all of that on-campus bed construction, not just for their students, but for their staff and faculty as well. And to put things in context for folks, the University of British Columbia is a very traditional land grant style university. Um, they own a massive amount of property on the outskirts of Vancouver on Point Grey. Um, much of the housing that Tanya is talking about is actually contract developed or built themselves um, by the university. And so they have a lot more planning control over their area. Now, to to contextualize this for Ontario, um, we also have institutions like that, that have massive land holdings that have quite a large amount of vacant land available, um, but perhaps don't have the knowledge or expertise or immediate financial resources to be able to build on-campus housing for both students and staff and faculty. And I definitely think from a, a staff and faculty perspective, um, it is becoming much more of an issue um, in hiring and recruitment and retention, particularly for professors, um, because some of the markets are starting to even outpace an assistant professor salary, uh, particularly in Toronto and Vancouver, but also here in Kitchener-Waterloo and 
um, some of the mid-sized communities uh, trying to find housing even as a staff or faculty member can be quite a challenge. Um, so I have seen it asked a few times in the chat, um, uh, Janet McGowan most recently, but um, I think you know the, the question that we sometimes ask is, what should be the optimal mix of students living on campus versus off campus? Um, we've talked a lot about off-campus housing today, but there's kind of a an elephant sitting in the room with us, uh, particularly in Ontario, of uh, on-campus housing and the fact that many institutions in the province have massively expanded without the construction of any net new on-campus beds. Um, most institutions outside of Toronto and Montreal offer their students a first-year residence guarantee. So every student in their first year is guaranteed an on-campus bed. But after that, um, you're kind of on your own. And what I would say is many institutions are struggling to meet uh, the demand of their first year residence guarantee and are rethinking whether they're going to even offer those. Um, so I guess really I'm going to pose the question to panelists. What do you think the optimal mix is? And what do you think are the benefits of living on campus or off campus? I've got some thoughts as someone who's done both. I was a residence left on. On, uh, at Waterloo's campus, and I also lived off campus uh, in Albert McGregor, which is just south of Laurier uh, in a heritage district in Waterloo. Um, but I'm intrigued to hear from others. What are your thoughts? What's what's sort of the optimal mix and, and what do you think the benefits and challenges are? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Glenn. Um, I thought I'd jump in first because I actually just had a meeting with our university yesterday. Uh, oh, good. And yeah, <laughs> it, it's a regular occurrence now. Uh, right. So in, in that conversation, what we were discussing was the fact that for the first time, Queen's University will not be able to guarantee um, housing for first year students for all of them. Part of that is because a number of their buildings are aging out and they're having to take them offline to do massive repairs to them. Um, but in terms of that mix, given um, the situation here in Ontario. So for people who are unfamiliar, um, we, we have a drinking age that's uh, set at 19. We have students that enter university as early as 17 years of age, most around 18. Um, so it creates a real challenge for us in terms of balancing those who are legally allowed to consume alcohol and those who aren't. So I do think that first years are better off on campus for a variety of reasons, partially because of that, partially because um, they're moving to a new community and are unaware of the rules. Like I, the number of students who have come from Toronto who said they didn't understand our recycling rules, for example. Uh, <laughs> I know it's something really simple, but it creates a lot of havoc on the street because then things don't get picked up. And, uh, you know, I'm getting complaints regularly about, hey, those students don't know what they're doing and there's trash on our streets. So, um, you know, what's the ultimate mix? I think it's going to vary between communities, obviously, based on, you know, the population in your city and then the population of students. Uh, but for sure, I'm of the opinion that all first years should be on campus if possible. Um, I also think that there's a big struggle, though, with the graduate community. In talking to them here, they're really struggling to find suitable accommodation. Uh, but these are, are some of the people that are going um, much further on who are going to do some great work. And I think there's... Um, I really would like to see the universities step up and provide that kind of housing. They're often the people who are doing the teaching assistant uh, positions, et cetera. So I see the need for the universities to provide support, particularly in those two areas. The benefits to coming off campus though are creating that independence. So you go from home to residence and then into the community and living communally with some other people and learning how to get along that way. Uh, so I do think in those, the rest of the years in, in undergrad, off campus does work. It's just a matter of whether as a city, we're going to be able to, to handle that number of people. Because in our case, the, about 20%, 20 to 25% live on campus, the rest off campus. And that's a large number of, of people to accommodate on a regular basis. It's, I think, in the neighborhood of about 18% of our total population. So it's large. So that's my thought. Thank you, Councillor Glenn, for that. Um, and I agree on the, the drinking age side of things, unless we are discussing changing the drinking age, um, definitely providing that barrier of separation between those who are legal and non not legal when it comes to drinking um, 
is definitely one of the approaches to try and control some of the social issues that come out of um, transitions. But also arriving in a new community is definitely a scary experience. And I know um, Waterloo and uh, the university and the city do a lot of work with their good neighbor guide and um, the wonderful world of Waterloo events that I have partaken in many times um, that happened before the pandemic. Um, so just going to open it up to other folks here. What are, what are we thinking on, on this, you know, optimal mix? If, if I can just uh, jump in here. I mean, it, it, it's looking holistically at students. I, I was out shopping a couple of years ago in Durham trying to buy something. I didn't get anything. You take the students, take the university out of Durham in the UK. What you've got is a sort of a, a declining sort of pit settlement with a nice church. That's all you've got. With the students, it's a vibrancy. There's a whole load of things. Take the students out of Cambridge. What have you got? Nothing. I mean, look, look at the... It, it, I think residents and local authorities really want to be so pleased they've got a university in their location. Liverpool, um, which you've all heard of, um, that's 70,000 students there in total. You don't notice that. That's not a ghetto. The summer in purpose-built student accommodation. They're all adding and spending money and adding to the vibrancy. And that sometimes gets lost in a lot of conversations, and particularly anybody who says, I don't really want any more students. And why? Don't you want them to spend money? Don't you want them to sit in a nice coffee shop? Why don't you want educated people? Why don't you want people starting business? And I, I does make, and there is no optimum percentage um, I would say more, more the better, obviously. But uh, and I don't see massive tensions where students are. I just see nice people um, wanting to. The only problem is, is when they don't live, when they're only there for say forty weeks, when it's a fifty-two week year. Um, but that's my view. I, I more the merrier, really. And I don't see sometimes the arguments of student studentification ruining areas. I see just the opposite. Yeah, definitely, Richard. And I think you raise a really interesting point of um, the examples of studentification in the UK and Canada, um, perhaps are more regeneration of economically declining areas than um, traditional displacement or, or gentrification in that case. But um, I definitely think there is an academic discussion that we could have in another webinar uh, with Dr. Revington and a couple of ex other experts from around the world. So maybe Richard will have you join in. Um, to that discussion there. Uh, all right, Nick, Tanya, what are your thoughts on this optimal mix? Nick, I, I was wondering actually if you could mention UTIL. Uh, yeah, well, I was going to mention well. I was going to mention them in terms of your third question, if that's yeah. all right. Uh, it's, I think we'll jump to the second because I want to provide an opportunity for Q&A here with the audience as well. So um, why don't we jump to them now on, on thinking about, you know, models of how we achieve that student mix in a responsible way. Sure. Yeah. So um, I think there's there's actually several innovative projects underway, in, I would say, in Quebec that, that maybe don't get as much visibility as they deserve, um, probably because of the, the language barrier, right? Quebec being a, a Francophone province. Um, and so the, before I talk about UTIL, which is what AJ would like me to discuss, uh, uh, there are several projects I think it's worth highlighting in Quebec to create housing specifically for indigenous students. So these are, uh, this is a population that's traditionally um, had, well, I mean, has, has you know, endured the, the challenges of, of colonialism, but you know, still has, um, tends to have disparate access to, to university and particularly particular challenges in, in, in accessing university. And so several at several um, campuses in Quebec, there are projects underway to create uh, indigenous focused um, uh, student housing. And so that includes, you know, kind of cultural uh, spaces uh, particular to them and also a diversity of, of living options so that students, for instance, who, who might be coming from a remote community, but have a family are able to bring their family with them and have find an adequate space. Um, you know, in most university residences or PBSA doesn't ne isn't necessarily suited to students with, with families. There's exceptions, of course, but um, that's sort of uh, the, the impetus behind that. So I think that's a, one example that's um, really neat here in Quebec. The other is, is UTIL, which is um, basically a, a social economy nonprofit developer um, operating across Quebec with a mandate to provide long-term affordable housing for students. And so they have several projects. They've they've 
been developing, um, some of which are in partnership with student unions. Um, and, and so the model of, of, of some of those, for instance, is um, the student union will provide some of the, the, the capital uh, and they'll go and you know find the rest <clears throat> and, and, then, and then build uh, a residence for students that, that will be um, you know, affordable kind of in perpetuity. Um, so they, they've done one with Concordia University here in Montreal and that's, um, that one is actually run as a, as a cooperative um, and in partnership with the Concordia Students Union. Um, but they have other projects that are are not necessarily in partnership with a, a student union, or not not necessarily specific to a particular university. But any student um, could apply to live in these in these developments. And so, um, I think these are really uh, this is really a neat initiative. They found this kind of way to make the financing work uh, on these affordable uh, housing projects specifically geared to students. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a, a silver bullet. I think there's questions of scalability, right? Like they might not be able to, you know, to have several projects, but whether they can can fully scale this up um, is still kind of an open an open question. Again, that's also I think there's a, the students are a diverse population with diverse needs. Their model might not be suitable or appealing to everyone either, right? But certainly is appealing to a. a a particular segment, um, especially given the, the kind of housing crisis. If you can get an affordable unit, that's that's a big deal. Um, but I think that's that's uh, an, an initiative to keep an eye on, and, and you know maybe to, to to imitate in other contexts if possible. Yeah, and Dr. Revington, I'm wondering also on this optimal mix question. What do you think? You know, sort of academically has been the the proposal there or let's say the debates around that optimal mix right i don't think there i don't think there is an optimal mix and it gets it can get tricky right because if you're talking about you know what percentage of students should, you know it gets you couldn't say that about other social groups you know what percentage of an ethnic group should be able to live you know in a given neighbor right it it becomes very problematic really quickly um but i think you know just getting beyond that i think uh, it, it very much depends on context. Is this a university that primarily serves local students who are live with their parents and are commuting, uh, you know, downtown to go to university, or is this a, a university where you know Queens is you know it's a small city. There's very few students from Kingston who go there. There are, of course, but most of them are coming from Toronto or Montreal or, or where have you, um, and so that's going to be a very different. Um, mix of students who are looking for a place to live off campus and who already have a place to live with 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 parents or other family for instance and you know again with that could also be um, students who have families or graduate students who who you know um, might have other reasons for living off campus you know, maybe to be closer to a partner's work or a child's school um, and I think we need to keep that in mind like I don't think it's realistic to to expect that everyone would live on campus that being said i think it's certainly true that at least in canada at least in ontario um there should be a a, a, a larger supply of on-campus or, or university affiliated housing um especially to meet some of those um particular needs like you know international students who are arriving with a family um and they might prefer to live on campus but that just doesn't exist in most in most contexts um and there are also other students who just enjoyed living in residence and would do it again, but the space doesn't exist. So I think there is, you know, a sort of, you know, market, if you will, for those students who would prefer to live on campus and it just the option doesn't exist. But I don't think there's an optimal mix. It depends so much on, on context. Thanks very much, Dr. Revington, on that. Um, just to highlight another co-op example in Ontario, uh, WCRI, which is um, just east of the University of Waterloo main campus was founded in 1960. And to talk about scalability, um, I am not aware of any other co-op that was ever formed again um, following that sort of model of a student-led co-op affordable housing development. And so I think, you know, it's really interesting what UTIL is doing, and I think it is a model that can be followed. Um, but definitely it's not something that I think scales at a, a, a good 
rate enough to meet the the broad demand that there is in the market. Um, but again, there's also the discussion of what are institutions doing with their land holdings and um, their capital um, in this conversation, as well as um, you know the, some of the requirements we have in Ontario around provisions of affordable and attainable housing for private developers. Um, right now, there is a project under development in London by York um, that is going to include the first rent geared to income private student oriented units. Um, so those units will be uh, filled by Western University, but they're provided by a private developer as part of a purpose built student accommodation development. So again, another really interesting question of, of putting that sort of social responsibility on a private actor. Um, Tanya, I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective with Northdale and the fact that um, we know the vast majority of students in Waterloo live in off-campus contexts. Um, what sort of the challenges and opportunities you've seen in that? And, you know, as someone who's lived off campus and on campus, um, I can say Waterloo is a great city to live off campus. Um, but I think, you know, there are definitely some challenges to deal with. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I echo many of the sentiments uh, that the other panelists and yourself, AJ, have shared. Um, yeah, at, at the end of the day, as I said, um, we just, we truly believe in terms of the importance of housing, whether on or off campus. Um, as noted in my presentation uh, towards the beginning, in our official plan, you know, we do have policy that speaks to, you know, as a municipality, as a city, um, our preference first and foremost is for accommodations to be provided on campus for many of the reasons um, that have been provided. And then uh, secondarily, in terms of the community, um, as close as possible to the institutions. Um, a couple of things that I know, yes, we absolutely have, you know, growing challenges, one of the big ones being affordability and uh, speaking, um, you know, as a as a planner at the city of Waterloo. Um, one of our education pieces is, is as a city, we don't build housing. Uh, so in terms of housing, we rely either on the institutions uh, to build it or the private market. When it comes to the private market as a city, uh, we have very limited um, abilities to control that. So we can't control the rents um, and, and turnover and all of those things. Those things are regulated at a provincial level in terms of the province. So in terms of a city, while we would absolutely love to have affordable housing, um, there's really nothing within our capacity to require or legislate that. So all we can do really is to, to encourage. Um, in terms of what the right percentage is, I'm, I'm not, as was noted, there's multiple factors to it. My personal, uh, my personal thinking is it would be great if all students who wish to live on campus had an opportunity. We know at this time that's not the case. Our two universities do have a first year, you know, guarantee. Uh, you know, we definitely see the value in terms of on-campus uh, residences, in terms of particularly for first years, um, as well as students who are new either to our city, to our province, or to our country, recognizing we have skyrocketing international student enrollment all across, you know, the country. And we know the challenges that come when people, you know, uh, residents come, um, especially from somewhere further away. Um, we also know in terms of on-campus housing, you know, they have DONs, they have supports, they have programming um, and, and whatnot to support students. In addition, in Canada, there's been some research that has been done by the academic community that has found that uh, students living on campus um, had uh, improved academic uh, performance than did students that lived off campus. Um, but as noted, you know, there's also tremendous benefit living off campus as well in terms of the independence really getting entrenched in terms of, you know, the community. At the end of the day, um, you know, our, our approach is we need more housing on and off campus, and it's going to take all of us working together to tackle this huge issue. Thank you very much, Tanya, for that. And um, I think, you know, we're at 12.55 here, so I'm going to wrap things up. I want to thank all the panelists here and the attendees for coming today. Um, I think we've had a very fascinating discussion about um, international examples of how student housing has been 
looked at and very much looking forward to keeping the conversation going. Um, I just wanted to have a couple highlights. For those in Canada, I encourage you to look at tgao.ca. We are based in Ontario, but we do welcome members from around Canada. So we encourage you to look at uh, joining us and, and joining our conversations. We have a monthly town hall for members across Ontario to discuss um, issues in their own communities and challenges that they're facing and sharing ideas, the different policies in a uh, open but uh, closed off environment. So you don't have to worry about information leaking out of there. Or you can bounce ideas off that are very much early in development. Um, I also want to shout out the UK Town and Gown Association. Please uh, go to UK TGA uh, and talk with Cooper more about joining UK TGA if you are in the United Kingdom. And then, of course, Beth Bagwell and ITGA.org. Um, the International Town and Gown Association is a wonderful organization to join. And I will say TGAO and UK TGA are actively in discussions around how we can bring together this international banner and really start sharing information around the world um, in more settings like these. Uh, the other thing I want to call out is the International Town and Gown Association Conference is being held in College Park, Maryland next summer. Um, this is an incredibly easy destination to reach from both Europe and Canada, and we are excited to potentially see many of you there to continue these discussions, along with discussions about various other issues that occur on Town & Gown, as well as various other programs that are really positive in how people are looking um, to bring students into communities and create really healthy, thriving, and vibrant areas. Um, I also want to shout out our folks um, in the executive office, Beth Bagwell and Susan Stafford, uh, for all their support in organizing today. Um, so thank you very much, Beth and Susan. Uh, and uh, thank you all. That wraps it up. Um, and we will see you at the next event. Take care.